verse 8, and Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. You're familiar probably with this. Acts 1 8 is the, is the Acts account of, of the Great Commission language. Acts 2 42 to 47 tells us what the church looked like after that invasion of the Spirit uh, at Pentecost when the Comforter came uh, in, in power. And it really sets the tone for the growth of the church uh, going forward in, in this uh, collection of stories. We'll, you'll, you'll see this in a little bit. We'll say it again. Really, if you wanted to divide, we're going to divide it a little differently. If you wanted to divide the book of Acts, you could divide it like chapter 1 through 12, the work of the Lord through Peter. Chapter 13 to 28, the work of the Lord through Paul. That's, that's a pretty simple cut and dry. Our videos we're going to watch in a few minutes. We'll, we'll do some different things as you're accustomed to. I will take a little different approach in terms of how we lay out uh, this book. Uh, so let's stand together. I want to read uh, Acts 1.8. Let's see, do we? Oh, okay. Just remind me that this is on behind me. I'm, I'm looking at a blank wall in front of me, so I, that's okay. It's okay. Uh, that always throws me off. You, you, don't, you wouldn't understand or appreciate that perhaps, but if you're standing up here, you're looking at a blank wall, first thing that goes in your mind is, it's not on. But it is on. That's all that counts. All right? So let's read this. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. That's the commission, the rippling effect. This is what we see in the book of Acts, by the way. Then Acts 2, 42 to 47. After the, after the church has been birthed uh, in, a, in a new way, there's historically Old Testament there have been a people of God and you could have called them the church in the old church in the wilderness church in the Old Testament but here we see a, a change in the relationship of the Holy Spirit he comes and invades the culture and they devoted themselves to the Apostles teaching that's the when the Apostles would have them gather they would gather and they and they didn't take it haphazardly uh, they didn't think that if if Peter was teaching in an evening, that they could stay home and watch golf. You know, there's, there was, if the apostles were teaching, they would come. Um, and the apostles teaching. And the fellowship, the koinonia, the shared life together. It wasn't that they had cookies after the service so much. It was that they had a shared life together. To the breaking of bread. That's, we've talked to you about this before, whether that was an expression of the Lord's Supper, that they had the Lord's Supper every time they came together. Some, some uh, gatherings of faith believe that and they do that. They practice the Lord's Supper every Lord's Day. Some believe it has to do with, with their, their, their koinonia, their shared life that they, they, they ate together, they lived together. And the prayers, they had a stated time of prayers. Think about this, this was a culture in Acts, primarily had come to, to Jerusalem for Pentecost. They had no, they didn't come planning to stay, they came visiting for the annual festival of Pentecost to, to be there perhaps, um, pardon me, for, for Passover and to stay in Passover and depending on the time they had to, to leave after Passover or stay through the other festival, up to the festival of Pentecost. <laughs> they did not come expecting the upheaval they experienced. And they had a stated time to gather Slave, a slave culture who did not have control of their schedules. But the mark of the early church is they continued steadfastly in these things. And all, all came upon every soul. It wasn't a casual. They were gripped with a sense of the holiness and the mightiness, the awesomeness of God. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. We were looking at that this morning. And all who believed were together. They, uh, if, you, if you heard they were meeting, you found them together. And, and by the way, there was no pl easy place for them to meet. They, they didn't get to rent the Colosseum. You know, they didn't get to rent the temple on, on, on Sunday mornings. They couldn't do that. There was no easy place. And yet this, was, this marked them out. And they had all things in common. They were um, many of them literally pilgrims. They were on pilgrimage. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together. So think about it. these are These came as Jews. The temple is what they knew about gathering to worship 
Jehovah. So they're, they're Christians, they've been saved, they're meeting, they attend the, the temple together, break bread in their homes, they receive their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, and initially having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day, those who were being saved. So you have this initial 3,000 added. We tend to focus on that. But day by day, members of their household, perhaps people they had traveled with to, to Passover, perhaps people who were indigenous who lived in Jerusalem, the gospel was being shared. The church was growing. It was swelling. So what have we read together just now? We've read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. Let's look at the book of Acts. Thank you. Please be seated. I would remind you, this is now, we've, we've finally come to a time where, where our theme verse, we, look, we reference back to that. Throughout the Old Testament, we were looking, we were looking forward to Jesus saying this. In the Gospels, we were in the midst of where Jesus challenged the religious leaders. Now we're looking back at John 5, 39 and 40, where Jesus said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. The book of Acts, uh, Scripture is being written. And yet the mark of the early church was that as Jesus was shared, people were coming to him. And in the early days, this group had an influence in Jerusalem so that it could be said that they, had, they were having favor with all the people. We're going to watch two videos now uh, of Acts from the Bible Project and then we will continue our, our summary and overview of this to kind of see how it fits in the canon and uh, how we can learn more about Jesus. All right. So uh, Luke begins, I told you this morning, I said, if you want to really get a, get a picture that's an astounding picture, read Luke, read the gospel of Luke, then go into Acts. But he begins where he left off in his gospel of Luke. Uh, the gospel of Luke ends with a, with a commissioning passage and an ascension experience. Uh, Acts tells us what the pursuit, the intentional pursuit of the Great Commission, the conference of the Great Commission, looked like in the growth of the New Testament church. And of course, I would say to you that while the Matthew, while the, uh, while the Matthew 28, 19, and 20 commissioning passage is probably the most well-known, the most recognized, uh, Mark not as much, even Luke not as much, John, where he breathes the Holy Spirit. Uh, Acts 1.8, I really believe, is, is my, if I have to pick from them, is my uh, favorite because he lays out the agenda. He says uh, in Acts 1.8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Get the Get the... The ripple effect here in Jerusalem, in all Judea, that's expanding out from Jerusalem, and Samaria, and into the ends of the earth, which, would, which now you're into the Roman Empire. If you remember in John, uh, we pointed out this, uh, to you some time ago, uh, last week, a couple weeks ago, this would have been called attention to, that, that 
John interpretively tells about Jesus' encounters in this pattern. He encounters Nicodemus in chapter 3, and uh, a Jew in Jerusalem. He, he encounters uh, a, uh, another individual in Judea. He encounters the Samaritan woman, chapter 4. He encounters the Gentile nobleman with his son, chapter 5. John is giving you this picture of how the ministry of Jesus was the prototype for what the church should, should do. And so you have this, this moving out from the circle, from the inner circle. Acts traces the rapid expansion of the gospel throughout the Roman Empire. If you were going to outline, one of the ways to outline Acts, uh, then you would, you would outline it along the, the path of three, three witnessing uh, settings. The witness in Jerusalem, chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 8, verse 4. That's about a two-year period A.D. 33 to 35 uh, has uh, Peter and the Jews, primarily the Jews. The the gospel comes to the Jews first, and many Jews come to faith in Christ. It takes place primarily in Jerusalem in that that area. There's a demonstration, as we read in uh, 2.42 to 47, the power of God that is upon the church. It was marked by by incredible power. We told you that this morning, that 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 is... you remember when we talked about David Sitton? David Sitton came and spoke to us. He missionary to Papua New Guinea and uh, had New Tribes Ministries for the longest. And uh, He's the one that the first time that challenged my thinking on how even today, going to unreached people groups today, they're not impressed with our, with our keen arguments and reasoning about the gospel. They really want to know, is your God that you're telling us about is he more powerful than our god or our gods and so this is a mark in the early church uh the the progress that goes forth and the second way you would that you would look this is the witness in judea and samaria so you've got jerusalem then judea and samaria this was a 13 year period in the book of acts uh it it takes up um chapter 8 verse 5 through chapter 12 verse 25. You have Philip uh, and the Samaritans in this. Uh, Takes place over Judea and Samaria, continuing with the expansion of the church. And then there's the witness to the ends of the earth, Uh, chapter 13, verse 1 to chapter 28, verse 31. It's a 14 year period, so this brings you up to about 62 AD. Paul, the Jewish Pharisee, if someone had been given a list and said, who is most likely, if you could have convinced the people the gospel was going to Gentiles, who's most likely to carry that word? You wouldn't have picked Saul of Tarsus. When he was converted, his name was changed to Paul. You probably wouldn't have picked him then. And yet he, with all of his Jewish background, but he has this one advantage that most of the apostolic witnesses did not have. Not only is he a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as he tells uh, in his resume in the New Testament, he is a Roman citizen. He's a Roman citizen. And toward the end of his life, remember when we talked about the intertestamental period, and I told you the influences that came, one of them was the, was the Lex Romana, the Lex Romana being the law of Rome. The law of Rome rescues Paul <laughs> several times. And the law of Rome is what ensures that if he lives to make it to Rome, he will have a hearing before Caesar. It's a fascinating providence of God. And so Paul has this as a part of his pedigree. And, and it stands him well as God selects him to take the gospel to the Gentiles. He has these, uh, these three uh, missionary journeys, at least three. If you, if you do any reading in, in, in Acts and the, and the life of Paul, you're going to see some writers saying, well, maybe he had four. Uh, maybe he went to Spain. There's debate about that back and forth. But he has definitely three missionary journeys and then three trials. So let's, 
let's move a little more as we've, as we've done. We kind of do an overview, then we dig down a little bit. Let's dig down a little bit into this, this outline. We have this growth of the church, and I want to point this out to you. Just some, going to look at some verses here that see that you see that in the early uh, chapters of Acts and even beyond, growth, growth. Look at Acts chapter one, verse verse fifteen. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. That was the the company of those persons was in, in all about one hundred and twenty. This is the one hundred and twenty that we think of in the upper room and so so the church starts with a nucleus and and again this would when you if if all you knew was what you saw the night before the crucifixion where they're where they've scattered from the garden where there where there's a, a group of folks around Jesus at the cross the next day you wouldn't think there'd be 120 people that could be found but yet as they begin to gather in the upper room uh, Jesus begins to make post-resurrection appearances to them. This was the nucleus of the church. And so then the, the Spirit comes. Acts 2, 41, we're told those who received His Word and were baptized. And that's the, that's the mark. If you want to know, well, why, why are we Baptists and not Methodists? Why are we Baptists and not uh, Presbyterian? Why are we Baptists and not Lutheran? You can go on down the list. Because this is the order. Jesus spelled it out in the commission. You receive the word. To receive the word is to embrace it as truth, submitting yourself to it. Uh, it's, it's the equivalent of believing it. And you're baptized. You're, you're immersed subsequent to your receipt of the word. There were added that day about 3,000 souls. Well, parenthetically, let me say, if you ever run into one of these people who says, well, church membership's a man-made idea. It's not a, not a biblical idea. Really? You ever notice somebody counted on the day of Pentecost? Why, why wouldn't they have said, and it was amazing. There was a lot of people saved that day because they were identifying a group of people as the church, the ecclesia, the called out gathering. They were marked by having received the word that the apostles were preaching, the teaching of Jesus Christ, the tying of the person and work of Jesus Christ to the Old Testament. As my friend Ernie Reisinger said, the book of Acts is the handbook of evangelism for the New Testament church. It's a, he actually wrote a book on it. And, it is, and, it, and it's interesting that the book of Acts uses the Old Testament to evangelize, to share the gospel, tying Jesus' life, ministry, work, to Old Testament. So there is church membership taught. Acts 2.47, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day. We read that a while ago. So they continue, all who are being saved. So now the description, what does it mean to be saved? It means to receive the word and then to identify yourself. This was not an easy thing. I want you to think for a moment. Where would Jesus' apostles baptize, immerse 3,000 people? Where would they find a place day by day to baptize them? And what, one of the interesting archaeological discoveries, so there was an article I read years ago about a, a Presbyterian archaeologist. I think he was from South Africa, maybe. My friend Errol Hulse is the one who told me about it. And he was doing archaeological studies in Jerusalem, around Jerusalem. And in the digs, they kept coming up with these, thing called, these things called mikvahs. If you wanted to, the English spelling this, M-I-K-V-A-H, mikvahs. These mikvahs were uh, things a little longer than the, than the height of a human being, uh, several feet deep, wide enough for a human being and another person in there. They were baptismal pools, and they were built all over Jerusalem. And this fellow, this fellow is a trained archaeologist who's a Presbyterian. He became, he became convinced, became a Baptist, when he realized these things were not built to sprinkle infants. These things were built to baptize full-grown adults. 
And so you had this, this baptism going on. I just have tried to figure out what that must have looked like on the day of Pentecost going forward. Acts 4.4, 4, we don't think about this very often because, because the Acts 2 experience kind of captures our, our attention and imagination. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. Now, if you, if you remember in the Gospels, we, we looked at a couple of different feedings of 5,000 men, 4,000 men, and we, we conjectured uh, that with their households, there were multiplied thousands of people being fed. And so the heads of 5,000 households were baptized, brought to Christ in the days after Pentecost. Do you get a picture of how the, how the church is swelling how just numerically it is, a, it is becoming uh, an incredible challenge to disciple these people, to minister to these people. When you read this, it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody that in Acts chapter 6, there's a challenge that pops up. Acts chapter 5, verse 14. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. And so the church is just growing and swelling. Acts 6, 7. This is after the deacons are selected and commissioned to handle the, the temporal matters of the church so that the apostles can give themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. What was the result of that? It clearly pleased the Lord. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Now, now Jewish priests are being swept up in this. By the way, this is after, we're not reading through Acts right now, this is after chapter 5. What happened in chapter 5? We're going to see this in a minute in a different angle. What happened in chapter 5? Ananias and Sapphira lied, brought corruption into this, into this, uh, this pristine church, this nascent church, and they were both killed. And the result of that was when the word got out about, about two of the members of this new church dropping dead before the apostles, fear gripped the people. And the line is, and none dared join themselves to them. I want to think about that. After all these thousands and thousands and thousands of people have been added, none dared join themselves when they heard this is serious business. People that want to tell you something, well, you know, I don't, this church discipline stuff, I just don't see that in Scripture. Really? Why don't you see if you can find some of the uh, ancestors of Ananias and Sapphira, talk to them about it. And yet in Acts, when they, when they correct a challenge that's taking place where, the, where there's a complaint about who's getting, is anybody getting preference in the, in the distribution of food, and these deacons are sent in, the multiplication begins again. Acts 9, 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria. Now, now this, you're moving beyond Jerusalem. By the way, this, remember, how, how, did the, how did the church begin to leave Jerusalem, remember? Scattered by the persecution. Focused and brought on by whom? Saul of Tarsus. I don't know if you ever thought about this or not. God used Saul... <laughs> even as an unconverted man to advance the gospel by getting the, getting the saints out of Jerusalem and to Judea and in Samaria. The church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace, was being built up, walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. So now it's multiplying in Judea, Galilee, Samaria, Acts 12, 24, just, just another line in passing. But the word of God increased and multiplied. Acts 13, 49, and the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. When it speaks of the word of the Lord spreading, it's not, it's not so much talking about the, the, the information being shared, that is part of it, but the spreading of the word of the Lord is it's, it's, change, it's gripping, it's having an influence, changing people's lives. Acts 16, 5, so the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. Daily. It is mind blowing when you really see what was happening in Acts. Acts 19 20. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. 
The book of Acts gives us a powerful, tangible picture of the commission of Jesus Christ to his disciples. Acts traces important events in the early history of Christianity from the ascension of Christ to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to the rapid progress of the gospel beginning in Jerusalem and spreading throughout the Roman Empire. Paul would write in one of his letters, those in Caesar's household salute you. (laughs) Brothers and sisters in Christ who are serving Caesar salute you. Acts is a pivotal book of transitions uh, from the Gospels to the Epistles, this movement uh, from the history of the life of Christ to the history of the, of, the, of the life of the Holy Spirit in the church. From Judaism to Christianity, when you read the early portions of Acts, as we read a while ago, they continue going to the temple. When Paul was first, first converted, he would go into a town and go to the temple. There was, there was not the mindset that said, well, I'm a Christian now. I need to stay away from that. They were going with good news to people who needed good news. From law to grace, the, the emphasis in, in Judaism had been Mosaic law, Mosaic law, Mosaic law. The gospel comes in. John says in his gospel, law was given by Moses. Grace and truth given by Jesus Christ. And so this, this movement of of grace, and so that so that Ernest Kevin wrote a book that when the when the gospel comes to play, it's the grace of law. You don't jettison law. The gospel comes to transform people's lives, and so the law becomes a rule of life for the believer. From Jews alone, that was what it looked like in, in Jerusalem in the early days after Pentecost. From Jews alone to Jews and Gentiles. They become the people of God, the new humanity, Ephesians 2 speaks of. From kingdom to church. One writer said this, he said, the profound changes that took place on the cross required about a generation to be affected in time. What Jesus did there, the impact of it, took about about 30 years or so. And that's what you see covered, by the way, in the book of Acts. It's about a 30-year time period. Acts is a history of extraordinary events. I told you about the three movements that we, that we trace it by, we track it by. Uh, Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. So then you have the, uh, it's kind of preliminary when you see what's happening early on. The witness in Jerusalem is, of course, Jesus, if you remember the chronology, Jesus appeared for about 40 days to uh, his disciples after the resurrection, which left a window of 10 days. Pentecost, by the way, if you remember the uh, celebration of Pentecost, Pentecost means 50. And so what it was, it was a, you had Passover, Passover Sabbath, and then seven successive Sabbaths. Seven weeks, 49 days. Do you know what, if you understand Sabbath was on what we would call Saturday, do you know what day Pentecost was on, the 50th day? Sunday. First day of the week. Jesus appeared several times in the post-resurrection appearances recorded in the gospel on the first day of the week. The scripture says on the first day of the week he did. The Spirit of God comes in might on the first day of the week and initiates and inaugurates this new era, the era of the Spirit, the birth of the New Testament church. So Pentecost was the Feast of Weeks, these seven weeks ending in a 50th day. So it corresponds 50 days after the resurrection. 
Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 19 to 23, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. The, the idea of first fruits to the, to the Jews and their festivals was this is the token of God's provision. So Paul picks upon this with his extensive Jewish background. And he says Christ is the first fruits. Christ is the one come back from the dead. The token that those who trust in him will follow him uh, overcoming death. And we'll see this when we get further into 1 Corinthians on Sunday morning. Every Jewish male in, in, the, in the Jewish law was required to appear at the sanctuary for this feast, this feast of weeks, this feast of first fruits. So just cite, cite real quickly for you Exodus 23. 14 to 17, three times in the year you shall keep a feast to me. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread as I commanded you. You shall eat unleavened bread for seven days at the appointed time in the month of Abib. For in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty handed. What is that? What's the feast of unleavened bread? The, the, the Passover? So celebrating what? The deliverance from me. Do you see the, the redemptive? symbolism woven all throughout this anticipating the life death burial resurrection of jesus christ 16 you shall keep the feast of harvest of the first fruits of your labor of what you sow in the field you shall keep the feast of ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in from the field the fruit of your labor what's the okay so harvest we see what that is that's that's the the first uh so the first harvesting of that which has been sowed so jesus represents the first of many more to be sown to be harvested from what's been sown uh, in the gospel, the advance of the gospel. Then the final end gathering in the end of the age is, is reflected and represented uh, at, at a feast of end gathering. So that's, that's all woven into in symbolic, uh, powerful, calendared, uh, reoccurring. In these times, Jews... Jerusalem swells with Jews and proselytes from throughout the Roman Empire. The disciples are transformed. They're filled with courage to proclaim the brand new message of the resurrected Savior. Peter's powerful sermon, which we, which we looked at the intro to that this morning. We didn't look at the sermon, but we looked at the intro to that. It was taking place at this time. Peter's sermon, like all the sermons in Acts, are built upon the resurrection. You see, the, you have the 3,000 responding the day of Pentecost. There's a, there's a dramatic healing of a man who was lame from birth. Peter delivers a second crucial message to the people of Israel and thousands of additional responses. The religious leaders then arrest the apostles. This gives Peter an opportunity to preach a special sermon to them. And of course, then that's when the, this, this joy, this this, this unbelievable experience. Think about it. It wasn't that many days prior that these folks were devastated. They thought the whole mission had come to nothing when they saw their rabbi, their savior crucified. And now, two months or so later, they're seeing this incredible surge in response to the message. But then you have the sad experience of Ananias and Sapphira. Who received the ultimate form of then? We won't say. I'm not going to say redemptive, corrective church discipline. We don't. We don't execute people now. But the ultimate form of discipline handed out by God in the church. Also, following that, the apostles are imprisoned and persecuted because of their witness. That's when uh, the seven are selected, and two of those seven, Stephen and Philip, become become incredible evangelists. Stephen is brought before the Sanhedrin. So he 
takes the opportunity when they've accused him of treachery, sedition, of blasphemy. He says, let me tell you, what you're accusing me of has been woven into your and my history. So he surveys the scriptures to prove that the man that they condemned and killed was the Messiah himself. Members of the Sanhedrin react to Stephen's words by dragging him out of the city and making him the first Christian martyr by stoning him to death. Who is there? Saul of Tarsus, who's been sent on a mission to stamp out the followers of what was called the way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So they called this movement the followers of the way. And they sent Saul on a mission to find these who are trying to advance the way and do whatever you have to do to stop it. Put him in prison. Saul's standing there consenting to the stoning of Stephen. And he becomes the first Christian martyr. This witness in Judea and Samaria, to expand upon this now, Philip goes to the province of Samaria and successfully proclaims the new message to a people who are hated by Jews. Remember the Samaritan woman? You, a Jew, would offer me water, she said. The Samaritans are half-breeds. The Jews treated them, the Gentiles were dogs, the Samaritans were worse. And he proclaims this new message to a people who are hated by Jews. Peter and John confirm, that, in fact, there's, there's sort of a revival that breaks out in Samaria as, Peter, as Philip preaches. Then Saul, of course, is converted. He becomes Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. And he and Peter, early on, labor for a while, introducing the gospel to the Gentiles. When Peter has the vision on the rooftop, still, think about this, guys, he's still trying to shed the ceremonial Judaism that is just part and parcel of how he was raised. So God drops a great sheet in front of him with all sorts of animals, many of them cloven-footed animals. It says, take, rise, kill, take and eat. Peter says, oh, no, no, I'm a good Jew. I'll, I'll never put that kind of unclean stuff in my mouth. And the voice comes again and says, don't call anything I've made unclean. How did a Jew, even a Jewish Christian convert, see a Gentile at this point in the book of Acts as unclean? Well, the Spirit of God says, okay, go to the house of Cornelius. The word Cornelius is, if you look at it, it is formatted in such a way, it is a Gentile name. And Peter's getting a lesson. So he goes, he goes into the home of a, of a Gentile, which would have been unheard of. He's learning that Christ has broken down the barrier between Jews and Gentiles. Paul writes about this in Ephesians 2. When you get beyond uh, uh, verses 8, 9, and 10 in chapter 2, by grace we're saved through faith, that not of ourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. And you start reading verse 11 and following, and he's talking about what happens at the cross, that the ceremonial law which separated, the law of commandments and ordinances separated Jew and Gentile, has been nailed to the cross so that that wall has come down. Peter is learning this here. Cornelius and other Gentiles come to Christ through Peter's preaching. Peter comes back and convinces the Jewish believers in Jerusalem that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. Look at Acts 11.1. 1. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. Their response when Peter gave this personal report was, so then, so then God has granted to the Gentiles, repentance unto life. It was an astounding thing for them to consider. But it's a part of the advance and expansion of the church. 
Persecution continues, the church grows. I will remind you Samuel Lam, who I had the privilege of meeting in, in Guangzhou, China, uh, 20 years ago now. He's now dead, gone home to be with the Lord. Told his story about how the Chinese uh, security would come and arrest him and tear up the area where he was teaching and training Christians. He'd burn, he'd burn the benches, burn the hymn books, burn his sermon notes, destroy the cassette tapes. Get out of prison years later, come back and pick it up. And he said, every time I got out, came back, the church had grown <laughs> while he was in prison. And so his conclusion was, he said, persecution, good for the church. And this is what we see in the early church. And attempting, it, it's, it would be like, the analogy I read one time, it would be like walking upon a grass fire and trying to put it out by stomping on it. And when you stomp on it, the wind that you're producing to stomp it pushes the flames. So persecution to the early church. And then there's the, <clears throat> the uttermost parts, the witness to the uttermost parts of the world, chapters 13 to 28. Luke, in writing this, switches the focus of Acts from Peter to Paul. Antioch in Syria, if you've noticed this, gradually replaces Jerusalem as the headquarters of the church. The epicenter of Christianity shifts. And all three of Paul's missionary journeys originate from Antioch. The disciples, by the way, are first called Christians. Where? In Antioch. If you had gone, we may not think, but if you had gone into Jerusalem early on and, these, and said, where are the Christians meeting? Where, where are the Christianoi meeting? They'd have looked at you. What? They weren't called that then. They got that name in a pejorative smear in Antioch. It means, it means little Christs. You, all you ever talk about is Christ. You, you must think you're little Christs. The disciples. If you had, had asked in Jerusalem, where are, where are the followers of the way? Where are the, where are the disciples of Jesus meeting? Someone might have told you if it, wasn't, if it wasn't totally secret. One of the things we learn is that according to the book of Acts, we're not Christians who are supposed to become disciples. We're disciples of Jesus, followers of Christ, who in our pursuit of discipleship begin to be recognized as Christians, as Christiano. Of course, we live in the West where that's been turned on its head, but that is, that's the book of Acts model. So Paul undertakes these three missionary journeys. First, the first journey, which happens in 48 to 49 A.D., um, concentrates on the Galatian cities. When, when, you, when you read the letter to the Galatians, that's a province. We've told you that when we taught through Galatians. It was a circular letter designed to go to, to the churches in this province of Galatia. The cities of Pisidian Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derbe, at the end of this journey, he heads back to Jerusalem where the, so, the infamous Jerusalem Council meets in Acts 15. The Jerusalem Council is, is summoned because there's a controversy. The Jewish believers are having trouble understanding how people out of a Gentile context can become followers of Jesus the Messiah. In their minds... You need to convert to Judaism. You need to be a proselyte Jew because Jesus himself was a Jew. And so if you go back and read Acts 15 sometime, they have this meeting to determine what is it. And they say, well, we're getting reports from the field <laughs> that the gospel has been preached to you whereby you were saved is being preached to Gentiles and they themselves are coming to Christ just as you did. How can this be? And so they, they settled the matter. And the council's made up, of course, of, uh, of the apostles, uh, of James, uh, the brother of Jesus, who, who, who stepped forward as a leader by that time. 
the Gentile converts did not need to submit to the law of Moses. In other words, they did not need to embrace Judaism in order to be recognized as brothers and sisters in Christ in the gospel. That's at the end of Paul's missionary, first missionary journey where he comes back to Jerusalem for that. Second missionary journey is from 50 to 52 AD. Paul once again goes to the Galatian churches and then for the first time on to Macedonia and Greece. He spends much of his time in the city of Philippi, letter to the Philippians, he would write back, Thessalonica, letter to the Thessalonians, Corinth, the letters to the Corinthians, and then later returns to Jerusalem, and then Antioch, the the hub of Christianity at that point. Then there's a third missionary journey that takes place from A.D. 53 to 57. He spends almost three years in the Asian city of Ephesus before visiting Macedonia and Greece for the second time. He is warned not to go to Jerusalem. That if he goes back to Jerusalem, there's a plot that's been hatched to, to kidnap him, if not assassinate him, then capture him and hand him over to Roman authorities. But Paul will not be dissuaded. So, before you know it, Paul's falsely accused of bringing Gentiles into the temple. What does that have to do with, you think? Gentiles coming to faith in Christ. And so they slander him and say, this fellow's blasphemed the temple. There was a group of people, I want to remind you, called the Judaizers. We, that's what we kind of refer, they didn't call themselves that, but the, we refer to them. And they would, they would intermingle as Christians. Jews would become Christians. Not not real sure if they had, if these were people that just weren't getting it or if they were false converts in the midst. But they, they uh, harassed Paul continually. When you read 2 Corinthians, he refers to them as these super apostles. They know so much, and you've let yourself be influenced by them. And he's mocking them. Uh, and so this, this is a group that says he's brought Gentiles uncircumcised, not committed to Judaism, they haven't undergone proselyte baptism, has become Jews, he's brought them into the temple. There's a Roman commander that steps in. Do you remember? And they're going to handle Paul on behalf of the mob and Paul says, don't I get what every Roman citizen gets? Fair hearing? And the Lord uses this Roman citizenship of Paul to stop his intended death in its tracks and sets him on the path to get to preach the gospel in Rome. Paul's defense before the people and before the Sanhedrin evokes violent reactions. The commander, this Roman commander, who now knows he's a citizen, and he, his neck is on the line. If in, in the outlying provinces, he allows these renegade Jews to mistreat a Roman citizen. He learns of this plot, conspiracy to assassinate Paul. He sends Paul to Felix, the governor in Caesarea. Paul is imprisoned there for two years, 57 to 59 AD. During that time, he defends the Christian faith before Felix, Festus, and Agrippa, Herod Agrippa. Remember in his encounter with Agrippa, Herod says, Paul, you, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. Paul's reasoning and showing how Jesus comes out of the Jews as the promised Messiah through the Old Testament. So he makes an appeal to Caesar, requires a long voyage to Rome, where he's placed under house arrest until his trial. He's able to teach and preach and have guests during that time and speak the gospel. So that's a little more extended outline of the flow of the book of Acts. And what about the title of the book itself? Acts. You'll see in various references, commentaries to it, the Acts of the Apostles, uh, 
uh, the acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles, the acts of the Holy Spirit through the church. But the word itself, acts, all the available Greek manuscripts that have this document designated by the Greek title praxis. You see that? Praxis. Which means acts. I don't know if, you're, if you think about it for a minute. It's for me with the word orthodoxy. Ortho, right. Doxy, thinking or, or teaching. If you're an orthodox Christian, not the orthodox church in, in, in the eastern church, but if you're, if you're an orthodox Christian, uh, then your thinking is right. It's lined up with the scriptures. There's another term, orthopraxy. Orthopraxy was right practice. They, they go together. Uh, there was no idea uh, in the early church that you could be right on your thinking and not practice. No such thing as a, as a not practicing Christian, as a, an inactive Christian, which of course is the curse of the, of the church in the West today. So the, it's the book of Acts. It's, it's engaging. It's moving. It's advancing. This word praxis was used commonly in Greek literature to summarize the accomplishments of outstanding men. And so some commentators, taking the the very meaning of the word, said that while they recognized the movements that we've spelled out, that you could really divide the book into the Acts of Peter, chapters 1 to 12, and the Acts of Paul, chapters 13 to 18. As far as the author goes, it's fairly clear, chapter 1, verse 1, uh, he addresses Theophilus. I told you when we looked at Luke, most excellent Theophilus, the Acts, he calls him Theophilus. He hasn't lost respect for him. He has cultivated an endearing relationship to him. So it's not as, a, as formal an address. But the author is Luke. You read through the book and you realize he's using we, uh, Chapter 16, 10 to 17, 20, 5, verse 5 to 21, uh, 20, verse 5 to 21, verse 18, 27, 1 to 28, 16. This is, this, he's, he's recording his own memory of the journey and the experience here. It's almost some sort of a diary. Uh, he's Paul's companion. But he also uses the investigative technique that he, that he set out in Luke chapter 1, 1 to 4, which we'll just read real quickly. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to, to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomp- accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word uh, have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that's in Luke, that you may have certainty concerning the things that have been taught. So the, to tell the life of Jesus and now the, the book of Acts, to tell the continuing advance of the church through the work of the Holy Spirit. And in Luke's writing, primarily through Peter and through Paul. As a close traveling companion of Paul, Luke had access to the principal eyewitnesses for chapters 13 to 28. He probably had opportunities to interview key witnesses in Jerusalem like Peter and John for the information in chapters 1 to 12. And I want to read you, there's, there's some things that he may have written as well. just want to just cite a couple of passages here. Look at Luke 15, 23 to 29. With the following letter, the brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings, since we've heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions. It seemed good to us, having come to one accord to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who've risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. Abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols. Remember the whole discussion in 1 Corinthians, just don't confuse the issue. And from blood, and from what has been strangled, because their practice was sacrifice. Okay, spilling of blood. And from sexual immorality, which I've told you before, we read that and go, what? 
it was not a given in these cultures that coming to Christ meant that, that, was, that you abstained from that. It had to be taught them, enlightening the conscience with the Word of God. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So that was their, they didn't put the law of Moses on them. Then in Acts 23, 26 to 30, Claudius Lysias, to his excellency, the governor, Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them when I came upon them with the soldiers and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman citizen. And desiring to know the charge for which they were accusing him, I brought him down to their council, to the Sanhedrin there. I found that he was being accused about the questions of their law, but charged with nothing deserving death or imprisonment from the Roman perspective, right? When it was disclosed to me that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, ordering his accusers also to state before you what they have against him. So that's just some writings that Luke seemed to be involved in there. And then forward up the date, the date in the city. Well, the date suggested for Acts is about 62 A.D., middle of the second century. Uh, there have been, uh, as you should know by now, controversies over the date. Uh, the more liberal types, did Luke really write it? When you, when you look at it and study it, obviously there's, uh, there's no question about that. What, what troubles people is what we call a perplexingly abrupt ending where Paul is waiting for trial in Rome. And so some have concluded that, that this was, the book was concluded before Paul went to trial. 62 A.D. would be the date for that. If it was written after that, then why didn't Luke include that? Uh, there's nothing about the persecution under Nero, which happened in 64 A.D. <clears throat> Excuse me, Paul's death, 68 A.D. Or the destruction of Jerusalem. So it seems that the, that the best dating of this is about 62 A.D. What's the purpose of it? There are four accounts of the life of Jesus in the Gospels. There's only one that carries on the story from the ascension into the, into the period where the letters are being written back to the churches that have been started as the Gospel advances. Acts is the historical link between the Gospels and the letters of the apostles. One writer said, and I agree with this, that because of the strong emphasis on the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that the book should be entitled Acts of the Spirit of Christ Working in and Through the Apostles. Luke himself, though a medically trained man, was also a missionary. He's interested in the advance of the gospel. And so he, he chronicles this. He himself was personally involved in this advance. So he doesn't write from, a, from an ivory tower of a historian telling us something that happened. He was on the front lines for much of this. But he's able to give us an, an accurate and helpful historical document, even though he was in the middle of it. If you look at it from a theological standpoint, one person said it was written to trace the development of the body of Christ over the one generation transition from a primarily Jewish to a primarily Gentile membership. And it begins to separate and make Christianity distinct from Judaism because the, the, the insistence that Gentiles become proselyte Jews first was never embraced, was abandoned. So Christianity begins to stand on its own. And if you're there, you can appreciate how, how the challenge of that came. It would be distinct, not an, not an extension of Judaism, not the inevitable consequence of Judaism, but its own separate movement built around a crucified, resurrected Messiah. Keys to Acts real quickly. Um, the growth of the church, that's how we, that's how we entitled it. Uh, the key verses we've already read, Acts 1-8, the commissioning passage, Acts 2, 42 to 47, the, or the life of the early church, where they all continue steadfastly. The key chapter is chapter 2. Chapter 2 is, is life-changing. The Spirit invades the earth on the day of Pentecost. Jesus had told them. Remember, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom? He says, it's not given to you to know the times and the season which have been placed in the Father's hands, 
but you shall receive power. You tarry. You tarry. You wait. And the book of Acts tells us the result of their waiting on the Holy Spirit to come. He transforms, a, the Spirit transforms a small group of fearful men into a thriving worldwide church that is ever, even to this day, moving forward and fulfilling the Great Commission. I think we were told at the convention, Karen, help me, 42 or 4,600 unreached people groups still, but one by one they're coming under the sway of the gospel. Well, what do we see of Jesus? What's, what's, when we look at Acts, how do we see Jesus? If you look at the sermons and the, and the messages, the central theme is he is the resurrected Savior. The resurrection of Jesus Christ pulsates through this entire book. The Old Testament scriptures are, are cited in their sermons for the resurrection. The historical resurrection itself is cited. The testimony of the apostles is cited. The convicting power of the Holy Spirit all of these bear witness that Jesus is both Lord and Christ died, rising again. Just real quickly, give you some uh, snapshot. Acts 10, 43. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. All the prophets, Peter said, bear witness that he alone and in him alone is forgiveness of sins. Acts 4, 12. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Well, what, is, what, what contribution does Acts give us to the Bible itself? We, we realize Luke gives us selective content. It's not a day-to-day -day diary of the church. It's not a comprehensive survey of the first 30 years of the Christian church. But it's invaluable as the background, the historical background for most of the letters that come subsequently. Without the letters, it would be difficult to understand. And the history of the early church would be a vague patchwork without the book of Acts. We wouldn't know why the letters were written. The missionary journeys show us. Paul's writing back to these places where he'd been. When Luke and Acts are joined together, this is what prompted the statement this morning, they offer a monumental account of the foundation and the initial development of Christianity. Their style and literary quality are unsurpassed in the New Testament because as I told you when we looked at Luke, Luke was a medical doctor, highly trained, highly intelligent. His writing reflects that. Luke, this is an interesting tidbit, uses over 700 words not found in the other 25 New Testament books. When you look at his gospel in the book of Acts, 700 words are unique to him. He must have had a real grasp of the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Because nine-tenths of the words were used in the Septuagint, the ones that he introduces Luke includes about 80 geographical references and mentions over 100 people by name in Acts. He's very familiar with how these areas are broken down, provinces, cities, the titles of people, consul, tetrarch, proconsul, asiarch. And these were challenged, by the way, at one point about if Luke was writing, and every, every shovel that's been digged up in the Middle East and proves that he knew what he was talking about. These things have been discovered, these titles of these people that he used. Another prominent feature, and I'll, I'll close with this, is the amount of space that he gives in to speeches and sermons. In the 28 chapters of Acts, no less than 24 messages are found within his 28 chapters. So it is really, it really is content rich to give us an understanding of what how did the disciples preach the gospel in the first century? And that's the book of Acts uh, in a nutshell. Questions or comments? Do we, do we have...